Okay, uh, this is Gene Franklin from Stanford University having a conversation with uh, Professor Michael Athens from uh, MIT at the uh, Tampa, Florida CDC in 1998. Michael, welcome. Uh, uh, I would like to, uh, to sort of begin with a little bit of uh, your beginnings. Uh, I noticed in your biography that uh, you uh, have attended a number of, of schools in your graduate education, beginning, I guess, in Greece. Yes. Where, where did you do your undergraduate work? Uh, well, I uh, actually I was born in Greece and I went to grammar school and high school there. And then when uh, I was 17, I was fortunate to get a one-year fellowship with the American Field Service to come to the U.S. and stay for a year and go also be a senior again. So I repeated my senior year. And as luck would have had it, I ended up in Mill Valley. I see. Attending Camel Pies High School. Oh, really? So I stayed with a wonderful American family for a year in between the graduates. So uh, Greece at that time, 1954, was in very sad shape after the Civil War. So within two weeks after arriving in the United States, I decided I was not going to go back. Uh -huh. <laughs> so. And uh, my professors over at uh, my American high school helped me quite a bit, and they wrote nice letters of recommendation for me, and I uh, applied to many schools, but I ended up at Berkeley. So I went freshman to PhD at Berkeley. Yeah, Berkeley. Okay. So uh, uh, it was a great time, because I saw the transition of Berkeley being a small school without me. A bigger school. And, um, sure. Now, and your your own uh, your own family. Did you come from a from a professional family with a technical background, or uh, not, not at all? No. Uh, both my mother and father did not go to college. I see. And, um, so my father was a small shopkeeper. Mm -hmm. So. And do you have, do you have siblings, Mike? Uh, I have one brother who lives in Greece. I see. Okay. Uh, that was it. Yeah. And then when you went to Berkeley then, uh, did you major in engineering from the start? No, I did not. Actually, I started as a chemist. Mm. Uh, and because my uncle was chemist and I liked chemistry and playing the test tubes. And, uh, and I did very well. I guess I was first in the class of 800. No. Uh, but then I decided, gee whiz, if I ever go back to Greece, there's more chemists than lawyers over there. So I decided <laughs> I better do something else. And, the Dean of Chemistry was very upset with me, so I decided I'd become an engineer. I had not before this idea. So first, uh, I thought I'd become a mechanical engineer. And they assigned me, my faculty advisor was uh, Einstein's son, who was a professor of hydraulics in Berkeley. I see. Uh, and uh, so he really tried to get me into hydraulics, and I saw all these mysterious pipes and pumps. And, and so on. I say, well, that's not for me. That, that wasn't it. <laughs> that, was, that was it. So, so after a semester of being a mechanical engineer, I said, wow, electronics is... So I walked over to Quarry Hall. Was this your sophomore year? Uh, yes. Sort of uh, that's right. at the time that's when right. you were making... That's so, right. so that uh, that's right. you sort of had the basic physics and chemistry that's and those right. things uh, That's right. background. That's so you right. So began with the circuits and that sort of thing. So, was Charlie Dessur there at the time? He must no, have been. No, no, no. Yeah, that, that was in, uh, we're not talking 56. Oh, that's right. So okay. I went to Berkeley, I started in 55. So, no, we did not come until later. Yeah. So I went to pretty much standard double E background, and then I decided, well, I better go to graduate school. So I asked, uh, you know, around, and... Uh, what were the more mathematical parts of electrical engineering. And someone told me, well, one is microwave tubes, because you have to solve partial differential equations, and the other thing was control. Mm -hmm. So at Quarry Hall, they had in display cases all of these helical start oh, yeah, looking the traveling things. wave tubes. And That's that. right. And I said, well, if I do that, do I have to build these things? <laughs> I said, yes, I say, control if you <laughs> So, but uh, I was very fortunate to, to meet Otto Smith that gave me my first exposure to control. And, and, uh, 
And then Lotfi and, uh, and Charlie Bissor and Art Bergen came, came over to from, from the east. Yeah, uh, sure. You guys went down to the farm in the south. And uh, so I was there right, right in the transition. At, at the creation, as and it were. I, but uh, yeah. I, I stopped with Arthur Smith both my, for my master's. Well, both your master's and, and, your, uh, and your PhD. PhD. But I had the ideal comedian. I had Arthur Smith, I, he's the world's most inventive man, and he will have 100 ideas per half an hour, 99 were sort of nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> but one will turn out to be very, very good. So. Uh, he was an ideal thesis supervisor for me because we could spend all the time. And then I had Charlie Desor and my committee who taught me precision and you know, sort of some discipline mm -hmm. and Lotfi that gave me the big picture uh, you know, before his fuzzy days. So you would say that these three guys were the most influential absolutely. in your, uh, at least the beginnings of your research absolutely. and professional career? Absolutely. Uh, and I had the system figured out at Berkeley, so I had almost finished my master's thesis by the time I got my bachelor's degree. So I managed to finish freshman to PhD in six years, which sort of broke some sort of record. I was say, that, that's pretty quick. That's pretty quick. And then, uh, then time came to find a job. So by that time, I was sure I was not going to go back to Greece. So. Now, excuse me, but uh, your thesis was in optimal control, was yes. time optimal control? Time was, optimal is that control. Recall, uh, That's right. uh, the issue there? That's right. So, so you got involved in, in that side of, uh, right. of the control theory very, 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 very early on. Well, the, the, the key thing was that when Lodfi came over to Berkeley, well, Charlie Desor taught me state variables, so that was the first okay. course that Charlie taught. Okay. And then the following semester, Lodfi sort of made my career because he had a seminar where he covered uh, dynamic programming, he translated from the Russian papers the maximum principle of mm -hmm. Triagin, and he also threw stochastic approximation, approximation. Giffer Wolfovich on that. And that's really what introduced me to optimal control and uh, sort of followed that ever since. Okay. And, and then, uh, as you said, uh, it came time to get a job. Then came time to get a job, and again, Lotfi was very influential. He said, um, I said, should I become a professor or not? And Lotfi says, no, absolutely not. That was before his five days, by the way. <laughs> uh, he says, absolutely not. You're too dynamic, and you go to sleepy school, and it's not for you, you know. Go work for IBM or some other big company. So I interviewed 27 companies. I, and I started interviewing two years before I got my PhD because I figured that was an easy way of seeing the United States. So, I see. You wanted to have your bases right. covered. Uh... So I interviewed 27 companies. I got 26 offers. Uh, Rand, which I really wanted to go, did not give me a job. <laughs> yeah. Because I needed the top secret clearance. And my, uh, mother's, uh, my father's sister was still living in Bulgaria at that time. So to make a long story short, uh, I had all these wonderful offers. But excuse me, were were you a U.S. citizen by this time? I I, I, that I I I was becoming a permanent resident. So okay, so you were in the works as far as the, the uh, IMS was concerned, and, and, and I could get a security. But but nonetheless, clearance. but uh, but the the man <coughs> didn't want to take the risk or whatever. Uh, well, a top secret is an absolute requirement. They, they want me to go there, yeah. but, but I, I I had the secret clearance already uh, at that time. You could get a secret. Right. I see. Anyway, so so of the twenty-seven, uh, uh, well, which I, one did you take? I took the lowest offer, <laughs> the MIT Lincoln Labs, uh, and the reason for that was uh, when I went to work over there, there was a fellow by the name of Kushner, uh, Harold Kushner, Harold Kushner, and Lee Gardner, and both of them working busy in stochastic approximations. I see. And Fred Schweppe was our section head and Peter Falk was in that section. So uh, okay. so I decided, you know, uh, I was very impressed that someone knew about stochastic approximation. And you were just fresh from the seminar. That's right. So That's I decided right. also to take the lowest offer because then I could tell Lincoln that I was doing them a favor working <laughs> for them. Of course, Lincoln was a communications <laughs> admin and I was a control person. So the, the deal was you let me do what my when I want, yeah, I'm because that. I'm doing you a favor of getting mm -hmm. the, the measly eleven thousand five hundred dollars a year at that time. 
So, um, so I went to Lincoln. Uh, Did you begin a collaboration with Peter Fobb at that point? Almost immediately, we were sharing an office. Oh, I see. So, uh, so Peter had just discovered the maximum principle, so we wrote a, a whole bunch of papers on, mm -hmm. on minimum fuel control and sure, sure, and all that kind this, of stuff. This was sort of the, the foundation of your book, I That's suppose. That's right. Then Lincoln, of course, didn't know what to do with us, so so they slowly tried to make me work on communication problems. And I say, oh no. He says, what do you want to do? I say, well, uh, why don't you let us write the book? At that time, Lincoln had 33% of their budget for completely unrestricted research. Okay. So, so internal research inter and development. That's uh, right. Fund. And, and Davenport had already written the Davenport and Root book in the Lincoln Lab series. I see. Okay. So I say, we want to write the book on optimal control. How long will it take? Ah, six months. Mm. Two years later, the <laughs> 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 book was written. And, uh, well, now, uh, while you were in that process, were either of you teaching the material at MIT? Or uh, not until almost the last year. Um, and again, so you had a lot of the manuscript done before. That, that, it was that's ever correct. Then I decided classroom. that this is a textbook because I wanted to put exercises, so I better try it out. And Lotfi also was visiting MIT at that time. Ah, okay. So. Uh, so he, he, he encouraged me, he said, well, MIT is sort of changing. So he encouraged me to, to go over there, and I gave some, uh, some lectures. And then uh, MIT, in its infinite wisdom, decided that I'd ignored the control for too long. And uh -huh. 1964 made me an offer, and as well as Roger Brockett and George Ames had, had also had just finished his PhD. So we decided to, to go there. Before that, again, I went looking for other jobs in the academia now. Mm -hmm. And I still remember Minnesota offered me full, I mean, associate professor with tenure. I see. At, at the grand salary of 16000 for nine months. Uh, and MIT, of course, made me the lowest assistant professor. Sure, at the bottom of the table. At 8500 a month, I mean, a year. <laughs> I but I had my consulting at Lincoln, so that really didn't bother me. So, uh, so I went to my and, uh, So you were consistent in taking the low offer again. The low offer, that's a very rational decision. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and that was really an exciting time, uh, sort of. Uh, we organized the entire curriculum of MIT. Control for now, the, was the Electronic Systems Lab, was that the name of the uh, organization that you uh, were uh, housed in, as it were? Yes. Were you in Building 20, or? No, we were in another building which <coughs> has been torn down. Oh, It was okay. the old servo mechanism lab building, but it was sort of okay. a wooden structure, yeah. much more dilapidated than Building 20. Yeah. Was uh, George Newton still there at the yes, time? Yes, George Newton was there, and Lenny Gould. Lenny Gould. Right. And uh, let's see, had, had the Newton Gould and Kaiser book come out? Uh, it did, yes, it had come out. Okay. But what had happened was that um, although they had some very good PhD students like Kipiniak and Chuck Miriam, mm -hmm. Gordon Brown had declared control dead. Yeah. So uh, yeah. no one there disagreed with Gordon Brown. So I, and, so and he was the founder of the control laboratory. Well, that's right, the servo lab. That's the right. servo lab. Yeah. So, uh, but then he became dean of engineering, so he could not have uh, yeah. influence. Peter Elias was the one that hired us. I see. He was the chairman of the electrical he engineering. A, yes, he was chairman okay. of the electrical engineering. So, so he was your shield from uh, from the dean, was he? T temporarily, yes, and <laughs> for <laughs> two years. So then, uh, did did you uh, begin by teaching the optimal control material from? Yeah, the way we did it is Roger, you know. Uh, the three of us, uh, uh, Roger Brock and George Zanes and I, we sort of agreed how to develop the curriculum. So Roger developed the state variables. I see. Of course, and he wrote his book, and I took the optimal control. Okay. And George Zanes was doing the nonlinear stuff. Yeah. So uh, immediately. Well, built when did Roger go to Harvard? Roger did not go to Harvard until '69. I see. I'd forgotten that part. Yeah. So that was in '64. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And okay. So then. Uh, then you, uh, I guess, that at that point began in the latter uh, of the tenure at uh, at MIT, right? That's right. 
Uh, which was without incident, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and my day is funny places, so it still continues to be quite in bread. So the control group always was looking looked up on as the outsiders. I was going to say, you guys were all outsiders. We were right? all outsiders, and uh, we did not do things in my tea way, and we grabbed uh, big in my tea, big shops the wrong way, so... Uh, now, Gilman was still there active, was he not? Not that, not that much. Uh, he, he had, uh, yeah, he was almost semi-retired. Retired or semi-retired, but then, okay. So, uh, so he didn't have a uh, strong influence. Uh, okay. Like yeah. So, uh, but it was a wonderful time. It was sort of, uh, uh, obviously, the material for graduate students was outstanding. It was a brand new field, there sure. was a lot of excitement sure. and noise, we had just ask for research money and just pour it. It would come in, yeah. And we had great students. How did you get uh, involved in the undergraduate program at MIT? Well, the, um, uh, again, Peter Elias um, uh, had decided to, that they might, they wanted to try an experiment whereby there will be an alternative to the classical network theory. And you know, 601 was Gilman's course, that's uh, correct. wasn't it? Yes, and, but I mean, that time it was on Amar Bose okay, was writing okay. the show. But that was sort of the standard that's network right. theory. Uh, standard network Circuits theory. and networks. So, but we wanted to try to do something that will bring some elements of computer science. <coughs> so Peter Elias uh, uh, talked to me and Michael Tertuzas, was also an assistant professor. Mm -hmm. Another young fellow that was also an assistant professor by the name of Dick Spahn, and okay. say, why don't you try to develop a, a, a sequence, a two semester sequence, uh, that will look at networks, but more from a system point of view, rather than the state variable methods and, and okay. stuff like that. Bring some of the graduate uh, material down into that, the that, undergraduate that's program, correct. kind of idea. And we developed um, we developed such a course where, like, the first course was we started with immediately with nonlinear things, mm -hmm. nonlinear networks, and um, and also finite uh, finite state kind of machines. I see. Uh, to bring the idea of state. Was there any uh, digital signal processing in there at that no, time? No, I guess no. The no, FFT it, revolution hadn't really taken no, off yet. Not yet. Day. Not yet. So okay. we effectively, we had the, the ordinary functions and the Boolean functions. Yeah. And then yeah. we made them dynamic and we introduced the idea of state. Okay. And then the networks and linear circuits and so on became like a special case of linear systems. Yeah. And then sure. I followed that. Uh, we followed that with the second semester. That was primarily responsible of doing that with multivariable methods. Now, this was taken by sophomores, is that where that course that's fits in the curriculum? That's correct. And it was an alternative to the standard to the 601. 601. And luckily, they said, well, if you took the second semester, so the, the first semester now was 601. Okay. And then the second semester, 602. And if you took that, then you could, you did not have to take the physics-based uh, sort of uh, solid state kind of course that we had. Oh, I see. And of course, so that was all, an the incentive, uh, all the people in, in computer science sort of poured into my into, course into whether or not they wanted to learn <laughs> multivariable systems or not. So, so the the uh, uh, the stick was more powerful than the carrot at that, that start. Yeah, that is correct. So it was <laughs> it was very very successful, and, and uh, we had a lot of fun with that. But then once the but then the the, the sequence stopped once the department <laughs> decided to become electrical engineering and computer science. Then they had to redesign the entire core curriculum, uh, so the <laughs> traditional symbols, I mean circuits and then symbols and systems course and then language and computer architecture. Yeah, we were we were talking earlier with with Lati about the experience at Berkeley, and I'd be interested in uh, in your view or uh, at, at MIT on the interaction between electrical engineering and computer science. You know, at Stanford we have separate departments. Uh, yes. I believe at MIT, as at Berkeley, uh, computer science is part of the electrical engineering department. Is that correct? Yes, it's, it's one department. Was it uh, was it that way from the beginning? Did right the, from the, the beginning. The architecture and the software uh, uh, programming and so on were taught in electrical engineering from the start. Uh, that's correct. 
the, 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 some computer science people wanted to split and create their own department. Sure, uh, that's why I was Following asking, because that, that's what lead. you'd expect. But then uh, Wise's head prevailed, and Davenport, who was the department chairman, so he managed the whole department together, which I think was mm -hmm. the, the, the correct way of, of going, so that there's been much more interaction in many areas between computer science and traditional electrical engineering. <coughs> that continues to be, so I think... Uh, it was the right thing. I, 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 as far as I'm for, concerned, sure. uh, was, was the right thing to do, and I think that, that helped him. How has the uh, a relative enrollment gone uh, between, uh, say, the more conventional electrical engineering or the physics-based, uh, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, well, the circuits and systems too, side as versus the uh, architecture and uh, discrete math side, the, the computer science side? Well, the, I mean, if we jump to the present time, MIT now offers effectively three, three options more or less classical electrical engineering, more or less classical computer science, and then something that blends both. I see. And right now... Would it be something that maybe elsewhere would be called computer engineering? Well, it's it's actually called electrical engineering computer science, but the idea is that you must take two in-depth uh, series of three subjects uh, in two of the fields, like systems or on circuits or something like I see. that. And then two from... from uh, Computer science, computer science, 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 science. architecture, and AI. Okay, but but to get uh, some of these people who are going to spread, uh, straddle the uh, that, that's the correct, and I think that, that, that that's that's really great side. because systems uh, it is always part of that straddling. Yeah, so sure, are certainly not sure. To go in, study quantum mechanics if they are interested in AI. Yeah, yeah. and right now these statistics are pretty much a third, a third, a third. Is that so? Yes. I see. Okay. Terms well, in, in but let's, let's, let's yeah, um, right. Okay. Well, let's let's go back then. Now, uh, have you been sort of involved in and teaching the optimal control kind of stuff then right through the uh, right through your career? Is that? Uh, I mean, I, I, that's, that's a very yes. Uh, I typically would teach one semester at the undergraduate level. Typically, uh -huh. in some sort of either circuits or systems. And one semester in my graduate optimal control course until about 1980, because then the multivariable uh, control system design revolution occurred. So I effectively scrapped yeah. the classical optimal control course at that time okay. and switched completely into the multivariable uh, control. And then soon after, um, the dean asked us because there were so many versions of control throughout the departments uh, to try to see if we can come up with the first year two semester sequence that does the system analysis and the control system design in a more or less integrated way. I see. And, uh, and uh, I agreed to head up that effort uh, and I had a lot of help from Professor Vanderbilt from the Aero department. Carl Hendrick from Mechanical Engineering, who's now over at Berkeley, mm -hmm. and uh, initially also from George Stephanopoulos from Chemical Engineering. So we designed these two semester sequence. So this was to integrate across the School of Engineering? Uh, course, yes, everyone, everyone in the so, School so, of Engineering. So not just, uh, before that time, there were separate introductory controls courses yes. in mechanical yes. and electrical yes. and yes. chemical, yes. I expect. Yes. Is that not so? That's correct. Okay. And, and so when was this? This was 1980? That was uh, a little after, I think it started in 19... We started version of it in 84, but it did not become formal part of the catalog until 86. Okay. And that was taught in lots of students. We were processing of the order of 100 students a year. Yeah, okay. Was there a laboratory associated with that? No, that was always one of the big problems, that laboratories were too expensive. And sure. They, they, not have that much. Uh, but it was a two semester course that was integrated sort of systems theory and control. That's right. What, it was what every system, engineer should know about that, that, That's uh, right, but the system theory was sort of sort of twisted to the fact that this will be used for feedback control. So notions okay. of, of uh, stability, close loop stability and robustness will come in the first semester. Were the, well, already the introduced, schools, yeah. Okay. Where the design methods will come in the, in the second semester. Yeah. It, was, it was really a very nice uh, okay. uh, 
then it, it disintegrated like two or three years ago because primarily the way I, we were running it uh, uh, required an, an awful lot of computer aid and all, all that you need. I see. The, uh, it was very little analytical homework. We would assign extensive computer aided homework almost uh, uh, every two weeks. Was this based on MATLAB or something like based that? Based on MATLAB. Yeah. And we got some nice sort of uh, models of airplanes and submarines and technical processes. I see. So it was sort of realistic numbers. Okay. And we would follow the same examples from the analysis True. all the way to doing an LQG design or an H affinity design. And stuff Did you like include that. the uh, nonlinearity and the uncertainty from the start, or was it mostly well, the linearization? Well, it was mostly linearization. Yeah, yeah, we, okay. yeah uh, we, we would start. I would expect that. What, what level were the students at this then, Mike? Were first they juniors? No, there were, they were a few advanced seniors, but they were primarily first year graduates. First year graduate students, right. okay. okay. So it was a right. fairly advanced. Uh, and it was very hard. We were telling the students that they have to work 20 hours a week. But anyway, now come back. You were saying that it began to disintegrate because why did the computer well, assignments? Uh, because uh, well, that required a tremendous amount of teaching assistants, and then the departments didn't want. Oh, it. I see. So, so it became expensive from it the became department expensive is, from the department point of view. And uh, was Penfield chair at that? Uh, uh, no, the electrical engineering did their part. It was for the mechanical engineers. Oh, it was the others uh, uh, that, didn't that, that really it. didn't. So in the end, it was primarily Iron and W that were running it. And, okay. And then it just became much simpler to sort of break it apart. And Munzer took the first, the first semester and made it a little more advanced because you know, some of the students were okay. coming. This is Munzer Dali. Munzer Dali. Yeah, when he's joined uh, uh, your back. Then. Okay, and and the, so then, what was the next? Uh, just on the, to continue the sort of your academic uh, involvement there after this course. Uh, um, what what's your uh, involvement in the undergraduate? Say, uh, well, I would just go and teach circuits. I mean, I, I see. The, no. Okay. Uh, I like circuits. There was, there was, yeah, sure. And um, so that would be my undergraduate yeah. teaching. But okay. but for many years. I had to, to do both semesters of this course. So I was oh, I see, see. So yeah, I really that, that's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, let's come back to another uh, another uh, branch of, of your career. They're looking in the bio, okay? You started this company, right? AlphaTech. Yes. AlphaTech. What was the uh, what was the uh, history of that? Well, um, uh, we had gotten some very nice research money from the Office of Naval Research. Let, let me backtrack. S since 1970, I had a vision that I wanted to develop uh, the equivalent of the maximum principle for large-scale systems. Okay. A decentralized maximum principle. And when I became director of, of the lab uh, in 1973, which at that time I changed the name to the laboratory for information and decision systems for electronic systems. Mm -hmm. Electronic systems lab, yeah. Uh, I sort of, in addition to the very good young faculty we had, uh, when hired an awful lot of, of, of postdocs. Mm -hmm. And we went through a binge on trying different large scale systems, power systems, manufacturing networks, economic systems. We, we always did aerospace, um, but but it was sort of so clearly they were large scale, but the, the cost of communicating uh, could never really be captured. I see. Okay. And if you're not careful in these systems, if you don't limit communication somehow, you get uh, sort of although you start with a decentralized formulation, you get a centralized answer where communication happens by very weird means. Yeah, yeah. Uh, In other words, the, the natural tendency right. is to become tightly that's coupled, right. isn't it? Because the more information, the better, typically. So then, uh, uh, with the help of, of Professor Davenport, that knew about these things, uh, we decided, well, if we looked at military command and control systems, mm -hmm. uh, that the cost of communication is a little more clear in Israeli communication. 
So I went to my sponsor, Stu Brodsky, that was at the Office of Naval Research, and I said, I want to change the emphasis of, uh, of my research into Naval Command and Control. To, to CQ? Into CQ. And uh, Neil Sandell, who was uh, uh, one of my former PhD students, he was also on the faculty, he was very much interested in that. So Nils and I went and visited all the Naval labs and met admirals and so on. Uh, and we also agreed to, to run an unclassified uh, workshop, mm -hmm. and which we ended up running for nine years, the so-called MIATO and RCQ workshop, which was the only thing that you could get people all the way from the command decision-making, which was a decentralized organizational problem, to things like multi-object tracking, uh, databases, communication, Networks and the like. And I assume all three services uh, participated in Yeah, that, uh, the. Uh, no, I didn't ask the Army. Uh, no? It was. It, 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 we got somebody from the Air Force. So it was primarily. Most of the Navy. Navy. Mostly the Navy. Okay. So a lot of, of people came over there and they came with all the interesting problems, but of course, the moment the, 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 the problem became interesting, they became classified. They wanted to classify it. And we couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> and then, did MIT have a policy against uh, yes, classified yeah, contract at yes, that time? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that was a trend all time, across the country. Since the, the mid 60s. Since, yeah. Right. right. So, effectively, one of the reasons that AlphaTech was born is that first Nils Sandel was much more of an entrepreneur than, than I thought. I see. And he was willing to resign his, his faculty position and go into that. And one of the things is that we had so many contacts in the CQ area. Uh, as well, in, in, at that time, in the Department of Energy, when Les Fink had this yeah. multiple award case right. on complex power systems. And Niels decided uh, to open off a tech and he'd be willing to sort of resign his MIT uh, faculty position. Of course, I would, uh, I would not. So the agreement was that he would be running company. And so Alpha Tech was born. And other people were involved right from the beginning. Was Dave Kleidman, that had good oh, yeah. with sure. Navy submarine people. Yeah. So Gali, that was really the only real engineer in the bunch that worked for climbing all the space shuttle and stuff like that. And Wilski, because he was everybody's friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Alan was on the faculty at the time. Yes, right? Alan was on the faculty. Yes, uh, sure. Alan became a faculty member a year before Niels did. So. Okay. So we started Alpha Tech and. Uh, has been now, was, nice. was MITRE formed uh, as in, in business already at that time? Oh, MITRE, yes. They've been around a long time. And yes, they had spun out of Lincoln, but that yeah. was in the 50s. Okay. Yeah, the early 60s. But, but uh, Sandel wanted to start his own company oh, and yes. take advantage of the contacts that you've had. That's right. At, at that time. And that worked out quite nicely. Uh, let me come back uh, a little more philosophically about the control field, Mike. In terms of uh, its health and its future, what uh, uh, what would be your uh, perspective on, on that? I mean, there, there's some evidence, at least at our place, there seem to be fewer people uh, majoring in control. We have a smaller number of people in our undergraduate course. I don't know if that's the case at MIT at all. Uh, but uh, maybe some slight indications of malaise, but what, what is your... Uh, I am experience and view. I my my personal belief is is that control is one of the most exciting fields, has been and will continue to be, uh, in terms of doing some some real research. Uh, to be sure, it does not have the glamour of multimedia, internet kind of things, uh, and um, but but I I firmly believe that that students that are firmly grounded in control and the related disciplines, I, I will always, I will never let a PhD student out unless he knows control or and stochastics. That gives them an absolutely mm -hmm. ideal background to do anything they want, and that, that has been demonstrated over and over. I feel sorry for people that go for fads. And uh, when I look at, at the future of research and control, if you look at the, some of the complex systems that we deal with, we still have a theory gap in the sense that we don't have the theory that will help us structure really these things from the basic, 
uh, first principles. So I'm very bullish in control, and uh, uh, at least at MIT, we see a lot of graduate students that start in computer science and become disappointed with the focus focus that they sort of mm -hmm. uh, are exposed and they sort of, if they want something serious, they, they can't control. We didn't have that many difficulties on track in first rate graduate students uh, in control at MIT. And, uh, and now I'm, I'm in Lisbon and I see it over there that the, again, people, you know, complain we don't have as many people in our classes. And, uh, and this and that, and, um, and we have to to try to make our courses simpler to attract more students. I'm 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 opposed to that. I think that that uh, we really have to to nail down to the students that some things are sort of good culture, mm -hmm. and you have to learn them, uh, and that's good for you. And you don't you, they're not in any position to, to make that decision for themselves because they're really they're not really exposed to that. So so I'm I'm an internal optimist about. And, uh, I hope uh, the future will. Great. We'll prove you out. I, I do too, yeah. of course. Now, you're at, uh, at Portugal now since? Yes, I retired from MIT in the summer uh, after being there 38 years for many sincere reasons. The, the primary reason is my wife is, my new wife is Portuguese. She does fast linear programming all over. <laughs> uh, and, uh, we played the commuting back and forth game uh, for a couple of years, but then uh, they were not willing to give her more research leaves. So for the next couple of years, we're sort of based in Lisbon. In Lisbon. So it was much easier because of all the changes in administration at MIT, the new lock and the department chairman, dean, and so on, that uh, I, I thought it would be much better to safeguard my slot. I do not play the legal absence kind of a thing. So I see. So, to, so you took early retirement. Retirement. And it's fantastic. Oh, okay. <laughs> I recommend it to everybody. <laughs> well, now, uh, will you retain uh, some association with MIT oh, yeah. during I, this? Uh, I, yes, I this can. I can supervise you? students and things like that. I don't okay. intend to teach courses. Well, I know in my own case, I'm officially emeritus, and they, as they put it at Stanford, I'm recalled for duty. Yeah, so, yeah, are you have such yeah. a? Uh, no. No. But uh, yeah. you you keep an office at? Uh, yeah, I have an office at MIT. I have an office. Yes. But uh, but your uh, your time is primarily now, at least since since when? Last uh, summer was it? Yeah, last September really. Since, yeah, since September. September, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much. And you plan to be based in Lisbon then yes. for? Uh, in, at least in that kind of years. years. Hopefully my wife will sort of convince them eventually to spend half time in the U.S. and half time in, in, uh, Portugal. in Portugal. So She's on the faculty? Uh, She's on the faculty at uh, uh, the University of New Lisbon. So. I see. Are you doing lecturing uh, there? Uh, in, in I, I was there uh, last fall, not this fall, last year, and I gave a course of multivariable control. In the fall of 97? Right. This semester, I'm not teaching, I'm more trying to get into the kind of research that they have there. Next semester, I'll give them a course of common uh, to I see. And stuff like that. But they have a very nice young group. It reminds me of, 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 of uh, the lab uh, when I was director. So, uh, I see. very young, aggressive faculty members. Good, very good uh, uh, facilities. Hardware facilities, with all sorts of robotics as well as underwater vehicles. So they're it's great material to work with, and uh, uh, they work very, very hard. So I hope to sort of help them. Sure. Okay. Research. And and uh, are you still affiliated with AlphaTech? Ah, uh, yeah, sure. I still own fifteen percent of the stock. <laughs> <laughs> on the board of directors. And I'm on the board of directors. Okay. Yes. But uh, but not a lot of active research there, or uh, uh, still some. Uh... Well, the, the research I tend to do at AlphaTech is highly classified. So when I'm abroad, I really can't quite do that. Okay. So okay. Uh, hopefully, in these things, is it will come in a concentrated period of time. So. And then, what, how would you describe uh, your research interests now? What are the what are the problems that uh, you, you mentioned that there was a theoretical gap still? Uh, how would you uh, articulate? Uh, 
some of the, the products maybe you would be recommending a graduate student to go into now? Well, I still think that we, we lack a, a methodology for classes of decentralized uh, uh, control. Control? Yes, and hierarchical control and so on. Now, there are many ways of looking at it. Uh, I'm much more pragmatic, so I don't think that will be a single maximum principle. I think it will be versions of these problems mm. uh, with, uh, with appropriate theoretical tools, but that's, uh, that's still my name. Main interest. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank it's you been very, very interesting, uh, and I'm delighted to hear you still bullish on uh, on control. Absolutely, right? we'll, we'll absolutely. Look, uh, look, look forward to your participation in the field for many years to come. Okay. Thank you. Thanks again. Okay. okay. okay.